Hello YouTubers out in YouTube land, it's me, your favorite Bible thumper, Mr. Morris, and welcome to Morris Ministries. And today we're going to be talking about Planned Parenthood and how it relates to you and I. First, I'd like to go through a little bit about the associated organizations with Planned Parenthood, or at least how it came to be known as Planned Parenthood. Uh, coming from the Birth Control Federation of America and the National Committee on Federal Legislation on Birth Control, and the American Birth Control League, eventually becoming the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. All the people who would be on the forefront of all of these uh, preliminary organizations before becoming Planned Parenthood would all be the same. People like uh, Margaret Sanger, Henry Ford, W.E.B. Du Bois, all these people uh, would be associated with the creation of Planned Parenthood as well as another organization we're going to get into. The real purpose of Planned Parenthood was not to actually inform anybody about contraceptives and alternative means or birth control in general, alternative means of birth. It was really designed to eliminate the threat of a black America or to kill off the black population. People like Margaret Sanger actually preached this very animately and there's various letters discussing this. Uh, not only just in her speeches, her letters, private letters, W.B. Du Bois letters, uh, and many, many examples of this, which I'm actually going to quote from in just a moment. The idea being that these people are a threat uh, to our current existing way of life, all these, and that the only way to overcome this or is to introduce them very subtly by using the means of the churches, uh, as well as black people themselves. This is why W.E.B. Du Bois was specifically targeted to be the man to carry out the job of committing or placing the first abortions, first contraceptive information to the black community because it would have been deemed a threat otherwise if it came from anybody else. See, W.E.B. Du Bois is a very interesting character being that he was an African American in the... well all this stuff really taking place in the 1930s, I mean, uh, from 1919 to 1946. You can see when he was writing in the Birth Control Review, uh, using and agreeing with people like Henry Fairchild Osborne, you know, the president of the Museum of Natural History at this time, saying things like, uh, the immediate need of birth selection as a solution of overpopulation, unemployment, and poverty and the relief of tax burden of born defectives. Marriages among persons who are financially conditioned doesn't warrant pregnancy. These things are, W.B. Du Bois writing this separately but not necessarily talking uh, with regards to Henry Fairchild's statements. These things are sinister influences and the burden is going to be thrown on the white civilization. It's a black man writing about his own black people. <laughs> But it does say the birth of defectives. Well, a lot of these letters and a lot of the argument that's been flying around is that it also talks about people who are mentally handicapped, uh, criminals mainly. These things are, these degenerates are a scourge on society and must be removed. But the interesting thing is, is that when Margaret Sanger is writing in, uh, what letter was it? Oh, well, I'm going to leave all the, all the information in the links below. Uh, she specif specifically says, Those least fit to carry on the race are increasing most rapidly. Funds that should be used to raise the standard of our civilization are being diverted to those who should have never been born. She's, in this particular case, she's talking exactly about a black America. Or the growing black community. But she doesn't just talk about race or the defective. She also talks a lot about regards to marriage. See, she uh, she possesses an idea in the American Needs for Codes for Babies. The idea that the population of offspring to reduce the burdens of charity, tax on public relief, and to protect society against propagation of the increasingly unfit. And in her letter, she proposed the idea of marriage licenses, the right to a common house, but not parenthood. You needed a special license to be a parent. 
And just that thought alone, that the government should be oversighting the means of population, well, that's no different than communist China today, saying that you can only have two children because of an overpopulation problem. A lot of these letters are specifically discussing overpopulation, unemployment, and poverty. Well, here you're having it again in the 1919s. 1919 through 1946, a very consistent theme, and it all relates to the creation of Planned Parenthood, informing women that there are other alternatives. She specifically says, stopping the reproduction by those who are unfit. But she goes on specifically to say that the feeble-minded and the criminals should be sterilized. Well, that's not necessarily talking about race, but as we know from her earlier letters, she considers black people to not be humans in the first place, and they are considered to be the unfit. Also, a lot of what Margaret Sanger was preaching was uh, relative to the family household. You see, the way the family dynamic is supposed to work and has worked for centuries is that you have a head of household, which is a man, the supporter of household, which is a woman, meant to instruct and rear young. Any other way, it doesn't work. This goes back to Hannes Herlong's entry into the Congressional Record of 1963 as it relates to Cleo Skuzin's The Naked Communist. You see, how to destroy a family home. Let children be in charge. Let's see where it takes you. Look at where we are today. <laughs> Look at where we are today. And she specifically says that Planned Parenthood liberates the potential mother and wife from the despotic father state. She's specifically saying how to remove the nuclear family, how to actually create the conditions which the Bible talks about, that everything in the future where children will be in charge of their fathers. It starts off right here with the means of Planned Parenthood, saying that you are no longer responsible for your children, and that it is biological slavery to have an unwanted pregnancy. Going on further to say that the ignorant and defectives to breed, to increase the death rate, and to decrease the birth rate are the only solutions provided to this problem. And since we've increased the death rate through means of war, well, and here in times of peace, how do you decrease the population? You decrease the birth rate. Because she says specifically, and this relates to the later agendas 21, 2030, and on and on and on. One of the reasons why the United Nations was formed is the one world government. Okay. She specifically says the United Nations and its subsidiary bodies, because the United Nations was designed to do this, all the people at the time would have known this, this is just following the Nuremberg trials, okay, have shed the basic problems of overpopulation. That the United Nations would take on the reins of de uh, depopulating the earth. Margaret Sanger also preached very avidly about unwanted stability with wanted children. And that abstinence and sex and sterilization are not means of a solution. That abstinence is, an act, is not an actual solution, but sterilization can potentially be. That abstinence doesn't uh, particularly work because it removes your sexualism. Because women are meant to be a sexual creature. And if you're going to do it, then what you're going to do is wait for this miraculous... Uh, period in between on which you cannot get pregnant, then you can flaunt your femininity however you wish. Okay, all of these weird things eventually lead you to the conclusion about how these children are undesirables, regardless of race, that you shouldn't be having children in the first place. We see that today. P parents do not want to have children because it's, oh, how dare I bring them into this world, instead of them see seeing them as a blessing of God in the way it really is. You know, you see them discussing the fact that children are burdens on them and not blessings. But you also specifically see race, race being employed. See, just as we were talking about before, W.B. Du Bois was specifically brought in because he was black and could introduce this into a black culture to remove the threat of a black America. I mean, my goodness, in W.B. Du Bois' letters, uh, his lawyers are specifically talking about it's good that you're doing these things because we fear a black America. <laughs> And all of these people would be the heads, directors, and founders of the eugenic societies of America. The eugenics being selective breeding, the means by which you can create a perfect or close to perfect uh, breed of people by controlling the conditions and the process of their birth. Now the question is, is why is it that way? Why on earth would America become this eugenics thing? 
How would it get that way? Well, it comes from Germany. You see, we're actually following a standard operating procedure that followed in Germany during just preludes to World War II. The process is called Lebensport. And in the 1950s, when Buck versus Bell had just hit the Supreme Court, it actually defended the right for America to be eugenics or practice uh, euthanasia, to practice forced abortions and things like that, things that Germany was doing. Lebensport is a process by which uh, soldiers were forcibly allowed to impregnate whatever woman they so chose, and it was illegal for them not to, and any woman that was unfit had to have a forced abortion because how dare you bring a child into this world. And it's going to happen today because Buck versus Bell gave the United States the right to terminate a pregnancy, okay, as well as sterilize or euthanize based on whatever conditions the government sees fit. And that's why it was cited in Roe versus Wade, the means by which Planned Parenthood exists the way it does today. Roe versus Wade in itself is an interesting controversy, you see, because it was all a lie. Because uh, Jane Roe, or Norma uh, McCorvey, as her actual name is, became one of the biggest proponents against the decisions for Roe versus Wade. Here's the woman that actually started the court case saying how it's a lie and how I wanted to have my children. She had doubts about it at first, most women tend to do that, but then says, you know what, I wanna actually carry through this, I don't wanna have this court case, it's wrong for mothers who are pregnant to have the opportunity to relieve themselves of what they would be considering a burden and how it is not right, it's not ethical. Became the poster child for the Catholic Church against abortion and the pro-choice movement. That's because America actually has the agenda to eliminate as many pregnancies as humanly possible to depopulate the earth. They want to commit forced abortions. They want you to actually not have the opportunity to do that and to not see the blessings of God. And there's another reason that we're getting to in a moment. It's because Planned Parenthood, okay, yes, Planned Parenthood offers many services and oh, no, 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 no. Well, 86% of all of its generated revenue comes specifically from abortions, abortions only and the sellings of aborted tissues. Most people say, well, no, they don't sell aborted tissues. Well, yes, they do. See, the laws that are written specifically say as long as it doesn't interfere with interstate commerce. It does, however, say that human trafficking, human trafficking and the harvesting of organs is illegal. But the way the laws are currently written, okay, unless organs themselves are fully developed, then it's not illegal. But Planned Parenthood just got caught doing things like this. You know, illegal transportation of biological materials. And I might have even been the uh, leader of Pan Parenthood who said how they were potentially harvesting organs themselves and how it gave them bonuses. Uh, the investigations on the subcommittee hearings came out and said all these abusive practices related to Pan Parenthood, how they were selling them to private third parties as well as companies for profit. Some companies, including the FDA and the Pepsi company. Most people say, no, Pepsi has not been putting things, in, putting uh, boarded tissues in their cans. Well, they did discuss it at one point. See, whether or not they actually did doesn't matter. What does matter is that the flavor per base of Pepsi, which is based on uh, kidney cell lines of children or fetuses, because Simtax bought $3 million worth of imported tissue from Planned Parenthood to do research on flavors. And Pepsi's current flavor base stems from that, which means that when you are drinking Pepsi, you are drinking the flavor of human, or that one of these subtle aftertastes happens to be human. No different than when the FDA uh, started buying f uh, aborted tissues to uh, check the immune system processes in humans regarding food. Well, when you see the words and terms natural flavors, you're actually eating people in some form of cannibalism. It also comes down to when Pepsi markets its product as philolucatin, philolucatonics. Well, the FDA had bought then to measure out what the actual proteins and how you would have to label it to show not just natural flavors because that's too broad of a spectrum. You had to specifically design something. And philolucatin, philolucatonics are... Uh, protein synthesis in children, more specifically infants, specifically infants, that those that are having it are going to get sick because it wasn't being produced to them in, chi in their childhood. 
well. That is because those amino acids and stuff only exist within those children. This is why it's labeled that way, and it is in fact a form of cannibalism to drink Pepsi, which is why it actually, a uh, study done recently, showed that it was just as addictive as nicotine. That being why cannibalism actually destroys certain parts of your brain and makes you more susceptible to like Crohn's disease, which actually destroys uh, prone being a protein in the brain and would actually degenerate and cause brain damage and would actually crave more human. It's almost like a self-fulfilling thing. You know, once you start the spiral, you will continue the spiral downward. So you have things like illegal transportation, you have things like harvesting of organs to be sold privately, and those specific companies putting it in your food. The question is why? Why on earth would you want to have a cannibalistic culture? Well, that comes down to, as were the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. People did what was right in their own eyes. You want to have these conditions set up beforehand so that you can have God come down. Little do they know that they're only fulfilling their own prophecies and they're actually making it happen. And they know this because most of those people are extremely satanic. <laughs> not, not getting into the reason that, you know, bloodlettings, blood libels of the Jewish people for hundreds of years. Not the Jewish people in general, but those that are Kabbalists. Because those that practice the Kabbalah need blood. Because blood is the life force you need to summon the angels that you would have on the Kabbalah cross. The Kabbalah cross is that crucifix of a four-dimensional thing on a two-dimensional plane of paper that lets you contact angels, which is why you need blood. It's also one of the reasons why the Catholic Church has been buying those aborted fetuses, but that's a conversation for another time. This goes in more into the consequences of uh, the spiritual ramifications. See, women do not want to recognize that having sex leads to pregnancy. If you do not want to be pregnant, then do not have sex. It is a very simple thing, sex being the definition of marriage. You cannot be married until you've consummated the marriage. The marriage being consummated, meaning sex to becoming of one flesh. That means when you have sex, you are officially married. When Jesus goes to this woman and says, you know, thou hast had five husbands, but the one that thou hast, thou hast spoken truly. <laughs> she has had sex with five different partners. And she's saying, Jesus saying, you're being a whore, please stop, <laughs> sin no more. <laughs> and sends her away. And in today's world, that's being promoted. You know, endorse a culture very sexualized very explicit but as that spiritually relate to us see and this goes into why abortion is considered murder abortion is in fact murder there is no two ways about it now most people would disagree with that and say that life hasn't started yet well if you're speaking on an atheistic perspective about where life truly starts if you say life does not start at the moment of conception then when when there's two cells, when there's five cells, when you hear the heartbeat, when there's brain activity. When does it really start? Because anything that doesn't start at the moment of conception, you're really negotiating, uh, you're really splitting hairs at that point. Because, well, why on earth wouldn't I want to remove it's just a bundle of cells, it's not alive yet. In a, or at least in a physical plane, people say this. And if that's the case, you're nothing but a bundle of cells. What, why can't we just murder you? <laughs> but they disagree and say, well, I am conscious. Well, it is also conscious. This is the difference between a Christian perspective and a very humanistic perspective. Everything has a spirit. It is conscious on some level. And here's the difference. It is a human spirit, a human level of consciousness. And this is where I'm going to describe where these things come from. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I believe it's Jeremiah 1.5. Psalm 139.16 uh, Isaiah 49.5 Isaiah 44.2 Isaiah 49.1 And Ephesians 4.1 All of these verses talk about the idea of how God knew you before you were and about how God knows you in the womb. So he makes a distinction between or that there at least exists a distinction between before you're in the womb and when you're in the womb and God still knows you which means you are a thing 
and you are an actual being that is human like in nature this comes into the jewish traditions of the guff you see on day six when god made mankind he makes all the spirits and all the souls for those that would have souls and all of humankind in general all the souls sitting up in the guff well how is it that a child's allowed to come down and this is expressed in Luke. Luke 1, 26 through 38. It says, And in six months the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled in his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of situation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived her son in her old age. And this the sixth month with her, who was also called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. See, it wasn't the fact that Mary was specifically chosen by God, but Mary also agreed to the conditions in verse 38. Be according to thy word. She could have said no, and God would have had to have picked somebody else. Oh, excuse me. So, it shows us the process by which things happen. You see, God sends out an angel to say, you are the mother. Does the mother agree? Yes. Goes back on God. She said yes. Same thing happens with the day-to-day -day people like you and I. You see, in the spirit, in the, the hall of spirits where the guff is, where every human soul lies, okay, an angel is sent out when, an angel, when a child wants to be born. All the mothers out there say, would you like to be born to this child? The mother then goes back and says yes or no to that child. Gets sent back up, and it says, yes, you will be born now. And then in, in the contraception, or in the conception, you are in fact starting. You move from the Hall of Spirits into the womb and you start making yourself a place for your spirit to dwell. And it happens for everybody. And while you're up there, you are in a place where time does not exist. Therefore, you are seeing all of time happen continuously. You know the means by which you are going to live. All the possibilities of your life and the conditions of your life you have agreed to before you're actually born. Everybody picks the life that they want to live before they're even living it. <laughs> it all comes down to you and your free will. You do not have to choose that condition of birth, but you chose it for some reason. What reason is up to you specifically. And this is how it works. For everyone on earth, and it is the reason why it's murder. You see, it is a spiritual contract between the mother and the child, saying that I am a living creature. At the moment of con at the moment I have conceived, I have started conceiving, my spirit will dwell within your womb. And the minute you terminate that, then that spirit no longer lives there, and it goes off. And it is the reason why it's murder. You have forced a living spirit, a human spirit, to no longer dwell on the earth. That is a definition of murder. <laughs> So in all of this, we see this general flow, but since Satan is the actual uh, king of the age, king of the world as it is now, Adam forfeited the keys of creation over to Adam, uh, over to Satan, Lucifer, 
because otherwise how would you be able to tempt Jesus if you don't actually have authority over the land you're given and Jesus only gave that authority to him for a short period of time until he comes and reclaims us and since it's his world we see that the prophecy is being laid out the governments of the world forming into one and making everything so blatantly obviously sexualized satanized luciferian in in nature of some kind or another and it's with these things that we have to start being extremely careful not to get into them people need to start taking responsibility for their own actions you see if you do not want to be married then you do not have sex plain and simple and this is why marriage is in fact a religious institution Gay people cannot get married because they are sodomists in nature. You cannot be a sodomist and be married because you are not actually having the action of sex. To gay people, to lesbian people, they cannot become one. This is why marriage is such a pristine thing and why it was ordained by God to be fruitful. Multiply and why God made Adam and Eve, each one made in their own pairs. But that is more relating to relationships itself and not so much into Planned Parenthood. But the spiritual consequences are as it relates to abortion. Because as we said before, Planned Parenthood is an abortion clinic. It's not really a contraceptive clinic. And even in contraceptive nature, you know, that means that you're going to be sexually explicit and go and marry whomever you will. These things are not endorsed in the Bible. You're endorsed to have one mate for your life. As always, thank you for tuning in. Any comments or questions, just leave them down below.